If uh, ten-year Treasury yields go to three and a half percent by the end of the year, as J.P. Morgan Asset Management and many others expect, will the S&P 500, Dow Jones Industrial, will they be able to hold on to gains uh, and continue to march higher? Yes, I don't think that the stock market is being driven by low yields right now. I think what's driving the stock market. And I just did this report today. Since 2010 through 2017, earnings have gone up roughly nine percent a year. The stock market's gone up eleven percent a year. Mm -hmm. I don't see this big out of whack. I think that combination of tax cuts, deregulation is going to boost corporate earnings. Strong U.S. economy, boost corporate earnings. That's what in the long run drives the stock market, not 25 or 50 basis points in yields. So even if the psychology though, and this is to your point, Lisa, I think as well, we keep talking about this 3%, then we talk about three and a quarter, then we talk about three and a half. So you're saying that even if we see some volatility around those levels, perhaps a little bit of pullback as far as equity prices are concerned, then there's a kind of realization that look, actually the fundamentals still justify whether it's synchronous global growth whether it's yep. earnings actually that justifies pushing the markets high even at this stage I think so I think that you know if you look at that uh, the Schiller model it's uh, the, the uh, cyclically adjusted PE ratios US stock market is very <laughs> overvalued on that basis but if you look at what's happened since 2010 I think the question we have to ask how much of this is fueled by low interest rates how much of it's fueled by earnings growth right and I would side with those that say it's more fueled by earnings growth than low interest rates uh, inflation. Is there a point, rates aside, is there a point where if we got a series of hot readings, maybe like that wage growth number from a few weeks ago, maybe like that CPI number, if they kept coming in, where you think that could uh, really spook risk assets? I suppose. I mean, but inflation, it's interesting about inflation is that it's autocorrelated. That is to say, that the best guess for next month's inflation is what this month's inflation is. <laughs> inflation tends not to be uh, like as volatile as, say, non farm payrolls or the trade balance. So I think it had to take something of an inflation shock. And I just don't think we see that in the cards. Remember, the Fed has been fighting to get inflation at 2%. And now, now we say, well, what happens if inflation overshoots that? And it couldn't be, say, a fiscal stimulus into an economy that, at least by some measures, appears to be. Be at a uh, capacity constraint? Sure, that, that could be one of the things that could, I mean, that is to say, it's a kind of Keynesian, right? Yeah. Where you have uh, uh, the economy's growing near capacity and you get more stimulus. But you see those industrial production numbers at the end of last week? U.S. capacity utilization, about 77%. We are well below where we've been in other cyclical peaks. There's plenty of capacity. I don't think we're running into bottlenecks in industry per se. We might be having a shortage of workers, unskilled workers. We might be seeing some of those pay raises go up. But I'm not sure that we're seeing wholesale inflation. It's kind of the opposite of for years people saying the uh, shortage was at the skilled end. If the uh, now the shortage of the unskilled end. They're saying both now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're saying both skilled and unskilled and all wages have to go up. Make this tradable. So. Yeah. <laughs> make this tradable, Mark. How do you take positions in the foreign exchange markets right now to make money? Very carefully. Yep. I know. I say that because yep. the, the, uh, the, there doesn't seem to be an underlying, a compelling underlying trend. Now, many people are very uh, bearish the dollar. Uh, they talk about the twin deficits, but the twin deficits. When did that emerge as an issue? It, it had a, It couldn't emerge before we got the tax cuts at the end of December, after the dollar spent all of 2017 falling. So for me, I think that uh, we've got quite far. Sentiment seems to be stretched. The euro has gotten close to that 126 level. Yeah. So I'd be playing from the short side with a stop above 126. Okay. Where else? Uh, I like dollar yen going higher. I, but though I do think that the Japanese are willing to accept a, a stronger yen if it takes place in a, amidst a weaker dollar environment. And the move is gradual. So far, I'd say the move has been gradual enough for the Japanese not to protest. You know, I have to wonder, at what point will your thesis be wrong? What are you looking for to uh, mm. possibly point to some kind of downturn or slowing in the earnings growth? What could be a, a sort of sell signal to you? Slower earnings growth. We get those data. We get the data. We saw Walmart today with the bad earnings, right? Are we going to, we're just about to get into the next earnings season. Are we going to get weaker earnings in Q1? And it will be just one quarter. I think that with the tax cuts, so what would prove me wrong? If the S&Ps hold Friday's high, for example, that's a, the euro gets above 126. Those, that's why, for me, I like, the, I like technical analysis, because it tells me exactly where I'm going to be wrong. S&Ps uh, uh, hold that level, don't make new highs, then, we, then it's a com more compelling case for a deeper correction. The euro gets above 126. I can see then 133, 135. But so I, I, so I, I accept your premise that how do we know when we're going to be wrong? And so that's why I like the charts. They tell me this level, we go through that, you've got to look for a higher level.